Good morning, Grace Covenant Church. Would you stand and worship with us this morning? Our God is a good God, and He is faithful from age to age forever. And amen. Amen. When I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, I won't drown. When I'm in over my head I know that you won't let me down When I'm broken and down to nothing yes, I know that you are always up to something good I know that you are always up to something good Great is 
things at our own strength, stop trying to worry about things on our own, and realize, Lord, that we need you more than ever, and your promises state that you are there with us, you are for us, not against us, and Lord, we put our trust and our hope in your great name. Because you are our Lord, the one true God, 
above every other. We find our strength. We find our passion. We find our hope. We find our confidence in you, Jesus. We need you more. We love you. We thank you. In your precious name, the whole church said, Amen. Would you agree this morning that we need him more? Because he is worthy. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, before you're seated this morning, would you hop out of your seats and visit with some folks today? Covenant, Dana Wardrop here from the Dream Center Esperanza in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. This is Daniel and Yolanda Rivera. Come on over. You know, it's really amazing to watch how the community responds to Daniel and Yolanda. It's clear they've, they've made relationships, there's a trust there. And as a result, they're able to receive the love of Jesus. Uh, it's really amazing. Thank them for their Covenant, thank you so much. It has been a blessing to have your team here this week. Muchas, muchas gracias de parte de nuestro equipo de Dream Center Esperanza aquí en Puerto Rico, Arecibo. Lo agradecemos tanto. Dios te bendiga. Bye. Well, recently we had the opportunity to pray for this team. So this morning you've seen the value of our investment in prayer and the success of their ministry there. Last weekend, we prayed for our Belize team. They're on the ground in Belize right now, so please remember to pray for them throughout this coming week. Well, good morning. Wow, what a great response you gave this morning. We are so glad you're here. Welcome. Whether you're joining us online in your living room or somewhere around the world or you're right here on campus, we're just so thankful that we could all be here together to worship the one true God. Maybe this is your very first time, your very first experience at Grace Covenant. We're glad that you chose to be with us today, and we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. You can help us do that in a couple of ways. First, by texting the word GUEST to 704 704- 486-9664. Also, after service, you can uh, join us in Guest Central. Guest Central is located just across the hallway, out these back doors. Follow the signs into the gathering place, and there'll be, again, some really nice people there to welcome you and answer any questions that you might have about Grace Covenant. But again, we are so glad that each and every one of you are here today. Uh, just a couple of things that I want to tell you uh, today to make you aware of. If you are new or 
are newer to Grace Covenant, we would love to have you join us at Grace Track next Saturday morning, uh, April 20th. Grace Track is uh, designed to help you discover your unique role in God's plan. And it's also our pathway to uh, partnership, or many would know that as membership here at Grace. You can find out details about how to register or more information by going to gracecovenant.org slash events. And then finally, our student leadership team have been very busy planning a fun, inspiring powerful, life-changing summer camp experience for our students. This year's camp is, the dates are June 10th through the 14th, and it's going to be in Bedford, Virginia. So if you want more information about getting your students registered, you can see information in the worship guide, or also you can go to gracecovenant.org slash events. Well, we've still got a lot ahead of us this morning, so would you join me as I pray for the service? Father God, thank you for your presence in this place today. You are such a awesome God, such a holy God, such a magnificent God. You are our savior, our redeemer, our healer, our soon coming king. And so this morning we just stop and we say, thank you. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Also this morning, we want to acknowledge that you are a provider. Uh, you allow us to be generous with your, uh, your finances that you flow through us. And so today, as we give back from our, of our tithes and offerings, we ask that you use it to cause your kingdom to grow. And then finally, we pray for the message today. As Pastor Zach brings a word from the word, we ask that you just let that anointing continue to flow from him and through him. And may we be different when we leave this place because of it. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I'm Justin Roberts, and I have a God story. I'm a deputy sheriff in Iredell County and work in the Mooresville area. And on Sundays, I come to Grace Church to help with the traffic so the members can get out when the service is over. Directing traffic for the members here, they're, they're overly uh, thankful about it. They come up and tell me, thank you for the job that I do all the time and, and bless me and pray with me for being out there directing traffic and my safety as well. As a child growing up, I grew up in a home where the only time you went to church, if there was a funeral or something, so I wasn't really raised in close connection with God. Easter, a year ago, I remember coming into church that morning. I had a lot of personal stuff going on with my life, a lot of personal issues. And I remember Pastor Steve uh, gave the sermon that morning, and it's almost like it was directed towards me about Jesus dying on the cross and forgiving us for our sins and being reborn. I felt like that God wanted me in church that day. When I left here, I went home and told my fiance what had transpired during the church and even talking about it now, I'm getting goosebumps. And I told her that I felt like that she needed to come with me and be a part and be closer to God with me as well. Being a police officer today is, is a very hard job. Uh, you get to see more of the, the bad side of society than you do the good side. Being closer with Christ and God makes me feel better about doing my job because I have a brighter outlook on future now. I know that no matter how dark my day gets, no matter what problems I'm facing at the end of the day, God will carry me through it. And I would ask that people pray for us as much as they could. And if you see law enforcement officers out here, tell them, you know, there's no officer that's gonna turn down being prayed for. I've actually had people out in public stand right there and ask me to pray for me. And I've, I've welcomed it open arms. That day that I was asked to come to Grace Church and work with work with them with traffic and everything else. I felt like that was a message from God to telling me that I need to get closer and have him in my life every day. What a sweet story, huh? Officer Roberts attends our Mooresville location. Would you help me just thank our men and women in uniform this morning? Awesome. Also, I want to uh, begin today by thanking our worship team. I was just backstage uh, before the service chatting with one of the worship team members, and he was telling me, yeah, pastor, yesterday 
I worked a 14-hour shift at Cracker Barrel. I got home at 11 p.m. last night. I studied charts from 11 until after midnight, and I woke up this morning at 6 so I could be here by 7 to play an instrument. He said, I just about have my fourth star at Cracker Barrel. And I immediately became jealous because I stopped with three stars when I worked (laughs) at Cracker Barrel in college. In fact, I think I'm going to go back to Cracker Barrel (laughs) after the ministry just to get my fourth star. It grieves me so. But can you just help me thank our worship team today and the sacrifice that they give? Well, welcome again to Grace Covenant. If you missed last Sunday, I just want to share the results again of a five-to-week sermon series entitled Uncharted. There were a number of spring breakers who we did not see. So uh, in the interest of an excitable announcement that I think you'll appreciate We set out months ago to begin preparing the way to grow a culture of generosity in our church family. We had 700 households commit to living a lifestyle of generosity. 82 of those were junior and senior high students who made a commitment. 119 of those had no prior giving history at Grace Covenant Church. And we are, to the glory of God, anticipating nearly $21.7 million in expected gifts over the next two years as a result of your responding to an invitation to generosity. Can we celebrate God and his goodness one more time? I just want to pause and thank him. I think that's fitting today. Heavenly Father, you told us, uh, we know that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. And Lord, I, I thank you for the souls that will be saved as a result of the response to the call of generosity. Lord, I thank you for the churches that will be planted. I thank you for the missionaries that will be supported. I thank you for the campuses that will be renovated and constructed. Lord, I thank you that you led, Father, you led by being generous and sending your own son and that you've commissioned us to give you all of ourselves and to to declare you preeminent and first in our lives. And Lord, we love you. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is good. Well, I also want to pray this morning for uh, the peace of Jerusalem as we're taught in God's word. Psalm 122, 6 declares, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. As you likely know, roughly 300 projectiles were hurled in Jerusalem's uh, direction last night. So if you would join me in bowing your head this morning, I just want to pray for a de-escalation in that part of the world and for peace to be in that city and for the greater region. Heavenly Father, Lord, Prince of Peace, we cry out for your divine intervention. Lord, you have called your people to be peacemakers. Lord, on occasion, peace needs to be made before peace is had or experienced. And the nuances with all of that are so complex, Lord. And we, we confess today that we don't know all of the answers. Lord, we are not diplomats. But we know you, high king of heaven, are sovereign and that you still have a plan for your people in the redemption of humanity. And so we pray, Lord, for the protection and peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we pray for all innocents 
in the region, Lord, who, whose lives have been disrupted, whose energy supplies have been caught uh, or rather uh, turned off or disrupted, Lord, who's, uh, who, are, who are hungrier and hungrier by the day, Lord, would you bring respite and relief Lord, would you bring compassionate people and make pathways so that everyone can thrive and that human beings may flourish. Lord, we ask this in your mighty, holy name. Amen. 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 You know, I was a college student uh, once. Uh, I have, I was thinking, what college story should I share this morning? Um, because there are so many, and one of my favorites that I don't believe I've shared here, I was at Lee University, Cleveland, Tennessee, sang in the campus choir, and we traveled someplace, I don't, I don't remember what, what city we were in, I just remember that we were often hosted by families of churches that we visited to save costs. And I remember this was the nicest place that we had ever stayed in, myself and two roommates. And I remember just pulling up to the abode and thinking, oh my word, tonight's going to be fun. And we played ping pong and we watched movies and we spread out our arms and legs and relaxed. I think their kids were gone on this particular weekend. We had three out of the four levels of this home to ourselves. It was massive. As I recall, it was about in a nine to 10,000 square foot home. And my roommate, Derek, who I was often in a tiff with. He was staying on the fourth floor in a room, I'll never forget it. It was Little Mermaid themed. <laughs> it had Ariel and Sebastian and the king and all over the walls. It was kind of fitting for Derek. But Derek um, was under the covers and sleeping soundly. He was the first to go to bed. And, and my other roommate and I, Eric, decided let's play a prank on Derek. And so we came up with the idea, let's sneak up like ninjas into his room, turn his alarm clock, we need to be up at 6 a.m., turn his alarm clock up about five hours and tell him that he needs to hurry and shower and eat breakfast so that we can get to our venue on time to sing. And so at 1 a.m. in the morning, we snuck up. <laughs> we snuck up three flights of stairs and turned his alarm to the minute before 6 a.m. And it went off a blare. This is in the, in the days where you actually took an alarm clock with you wherever you went. And it went off blaring. And we heard it from a level or two below. And we sat down there and we laughed our heads off when we heard the shower turn on. <laughs> and 30 minutes later, we started hearing Derek, we called him Big D, we heard Big D's luggage hitting every step on the way down four flights of stairs, eager to eat breakfast and sing. And we sat and he gets down at the bottom of the step and here me and my roommate sit in our PJs. <laughs> And we say, Derek, dude, it's only 1 a.m. We're just teasing. And you would have thought that we burned his house down. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was so mad. He was angry for the remainder of that weekend trip. He was angry the next weekend's trip. And he continued to persist until God did a wonderful redemptive work and brought us back together. Um, but I will tell you, I have thrown water balloons at campus safety. I have stolen temporarily campus safety's golf carts to ride them around Cleveland. Um, I have repelled off of the Khan Center, which at the time was the largest, uh, tallest building on the, the property, tying off a repelling rope 
to an HVAC unit on the rooftop. And I thought that what I needed going into college was freedom. Freedom. How many of you know what I needed was wisdom? <laughs> what, what I needed was, was wisdom. I was drowning in freedom, obviously. And the freedom didn't really help me mature into Christ's likeness. Honestly, I can't think of a better setup for this series, this new series on the life of David. We're calling this series Lions, Giants, and Bears, Oh My. So if you have your Bibles open to 1 Samuel, we'll be in the books 1 and 2 Samuel. I'll tell you this is going to be a longer series than most. Generally, we're at five to six weeks in a sermon series. This week, uh, this, uh, week we're, we're introducing a series that's going to take us well into the summer. And if you would say, um, that's too long for me, Pastor, I would say... Everything is a matter of perspective. Uh, on one occasion, I took our church in Wisconsin through the book of Acts over the course of two and a half years. Okay, how many of you are feeling a little bit better about midsummer? All right, so we're going to do the life of David uh, together. David, to say that he is an important person in the Bible would be a massive understatement. We have more biographical material on David than on any other figure in the Bible other than Jesus Christ. To Jewish people, David was more than just a historical figure. He was a hero. He was an icon. He was a symbol of Israel's past greatness and also her future hope. And there are stories in these two books that we're going to read that are absolutely going to blow our minds. Uh, these pages are chock full of drama and suspense and surprise. Um, and the story begins with this uh, obscure life of a shepherd boy. David is the runt of the litter. He's the youngest of eight Sons of Jesse, David has seven older brothers. How many of you have a few older siblings who've given you a hard knock or two? Okay. Um, how many of you have received a noogie at some point in your childhood? Where are my swirly folks? How many of you have received a swirly? Anybody? Oh, you poor soul. I'm so sorry. That's a tough one, those swirlies. How many of you have been scared by a sibling to the point where we won't go any farther, but you get what I'm saying? How many of you have had a bug placed on your face by a sibling? How many of you have had your fingernails or toenails painted while you were sleeping? Um, how many of you experienced playing hide and seek only to learn that no one actually came looking for you? <laughs> Okay, that is, this is all sibling behavior, right? Uh, who here has been served a brownie lookalike? Do you remember that one? Anybody at all? A few here. It's not fun, okay? It's, it's not fun. Just imagine David's childhood, Okay? And yet, through an act of stunning courage, David becomes a soldier exclusively for the purpose of defeating this giant named Goliath. I can't wait till we get to that part of the series. And from there, he becomes the most popular person in all of Israel. This is a big deal. It was, it was as um, though... Um, that were enough, and, and yet he was also this prolific songwriter. He could have won, you know, the golden ticket in America's Got Talent, or the golden buzzer, or whatever it is. Um, he would have won American Idol, uh, and if that wasn't enough, the Bible says that David um, was ruddy, okay, ruddy, 
um, kind of sounds like rustic uh, or rough around the edges. That's not what that means. It means a, a pinkish complexion, okay? So he has a pink or a red complexion with a fine appearance and, and with handsome features. The scriptures tell us he had, he had beautiful eyes and that he was good looking. And, and the Bible tells us that God said that David was a man after his own heart. And yet, personal sin devastated, devastated David's life. Not only his own life, but the life of an entire nation. And here's what in particular is meaningful to you and I today, more than just an interesting story about a great man. David lays down a pattern of salvation for us. This is a theological nature of, of his life. He, his story creates a vacuum that only who will one day fill? The king who is to come, the king of all kings, Christ, right? So David's story uh, comes at a time where all of Israel is whining they're boohooing because they think they need a king. Like all of the other nations who have kings. Uh, who had their king been up until the point where Israel whined about not having a king? Their king had been God himself. God led them by day and by night. Um, God had been their king. Israel has a lot of national Pride, Israel felt that the king was the only one, little K king, who could give them prosperity and security. Church family, may I remind you in an otherwise tense election year that while we are to pray for the leaders of our country, God is the king of his people. God is the king of his people. We don't need another king outside of God. He is our hope. So if you're searching for identity or security or happiness, you don't need to travel to Washington. You have that in the, you don't need to leave this room. You have that in the Lord. Jesus can meet you here today. He can call you his son or his daughter. He'll give you all the significance you need He'll give you self-worth. Life is not about, amen, how smart we are. Life is not about how much money we have. Life is not about our family name. Life is not about how pretty you are. In fact, you could argue that David's prettiness created quite a bit of a problem for him. Remember, church family, that your whole life can be ruined by someone on Facebook who you think looks good, has more friends than you, or whose house is prettier than yours. And if it's not the impropriety trap, if it's not the moral trap, if it's not the high school sweetheart trap, or the ifs and buts trap, it's the comparison trap. The one we fall into on Instagram where everybody knows, everybody knows that she didn't post the pic so that you'd see her brownies, even though the post was about the brownies, but it was so that you would see the amazing, what, kitchen. And of course that happens. And I'll tell you, church family, if your self-worth rises or falls based on how well you stack up against your neighbor. People you admire, people you look up to. The life of David teaches us the admiration of your community is not as important as the approval of God. Amen. What our generation yearns for is not in fact what our generation needs. David's story opens up with another story that first feels a bit out of place. In fact, 
I want to quickly read, um, and did already last Sunday when I had the privilege of dedicating several children for the Lord, but 1 Samuel actually opens with the story, not of David, but of Hannah. So this morning we're going to look a little more in depth at Hannah's pain, Hannah's purpose, Hannah's praise, and Hannah's promise. Hannah's pain, purpose, praise, and promise. For those of you who like alliteration, today is your day. Okay? So you enjoy this. I don't do alliteration very often, so soak it in. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim. Sounds like a hotel chain, doesn't it? <laughs> of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And he had how many wives? Two. Two. Now, the Bible does not, I want you to know, condone, condone or promote polygamy. But it does tolerate it. It does tolerate it. And I will tell you, the practice of taking more than one spouse got a lot of people in a lot of trouble. Okay? Okay? So the Bible's not advocating here. It's just simply describing, not prescribing. Okay? The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Panini, who was a great sandwich searer. Listen, I'm a middle-aged dad, okay? It's just what you get. It's just what you get from time to time. The Hebrew is Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had how many? None. And this man, Elkanah, went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he'd give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion. You know you're loved when you get two scoops of fruit salad, right? (laughs) For he loved Hannah although the Lord had closed her womb. See, that's Hannah's pain. She's barren. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that Penina provoked Hannah. Therefore she wept and did not what? She didn't eat. Notice that Hannah was hurt so badly she could not even consume food. Now, I'll tell you that childlessness is difficult for any woman in any culture, but in this society, void of hope of modern medicine, it was particularly despairing. It was literally the worst affliction a woman could endure. And for a number of reasons. Today, kids cost us money. Amen? Amen. Back then, kids were a financial asset, not a financial burden. The more sons you had in an agrarian society, the more workers you had to till the land, the more income you could generate through your crops, So more sons meant more prosperity in a financial sense. Furthermore, they were your 401k. Literally. The more kids you had, the better you'd be taken care of. That is the Burris family plan, by the way. (laughs) I only need one of them to get wealthy and live local. That's all I need. (laughs) One out of four. Chances are good. More children in this society means more economic health and more military health. 
Thus, if a woman produced more kids, she was thought to be a blessing to the nation, and this garnered more respect from the nation's citizens. And for the nation of Israel in particular, there was also the significant promise from God for an eternal inheritance. This land had been given to the Israelites and to their children forever. And if you didn't have sons, your family was cut off from that inheritance. The OT scholar Walter Brueggemann said, barrenness in any ancient text is the effective metaphor of hopelessness. For without children, there was no foreseeable future for yourself, for your family, for your people. Now, I want to make this very clear that my point this morning is not that children are the mark of success today. Today, okay? Women add value to society in innumerable ways today. My point is simply that the primary thing that gave women value in Hannah's day was the ability to produce children, that which Hannah herself did not have. And what made matters worse is that her rival, her rival in a polygamous marriage had lots of children and Penina used that to irritate her to rub salt in the womb, she'd have her sons leave the proverbial toilet seat up just so that Hannah would have to look at it. Hannah was grievously bothered. She would rightfully thunder internally. Inside of her stomach was this big knot of deep sadness and, and insecurity and, and the loathing of others. Verse 10 tells us that Hannah was deeply distressed, that Hannah wept profusely, and Hannah then prayed. And as I read last week, she asked God to show her what she'd done to anger him. Maybe you've been there. Maybe, maybe you've shaken your fists at the heavens and experienced the double indignity then of not hearing God's reply. No one was on the other end of the phone. It was just silence. So then Hannah makes a vow. Hannah finds the courage and promises God what she'll do if God blesses her with a child. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Penina is sending her Christmas cards of the four boys on them with she and Elkanah grinning from ear to ear. Penina inserts an eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper into the card, Times New Roman, 10 size font, because the picture alone is not enough to communicate her joy. So she wants to express all that God has done since last Christmas on this extra page. Little Johnny celebrated his one-year birthday, and Henry learned how to ride a bike, and Jack got his braces off, and Charlie just graduated from camel driver's ed. <laughs> and by the way, she adds, Penina adds, Elkanah's other wife is getting really good at dishwashing. That's what she brings to the table of our family. Hannah's life, understand, was miserable. She perceived that she'd failed in the one thing that she thought mattered. Are you feeling her pain this morning at all? Are you able to empathize 
with Hannah at all today? Elkanah, her husband, bless his heart. He's like many of us husbands. He's very sweet, but he's also quite clueless. Look at what he does in verse eight. Then Elkanah, her husband, says to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than 10 sons? How many of you know that made her feel a lot better? Lord, help this flailing man. <laughs> and what I hope was the worst thing Elkanah said in either of his marriages. He says, just look at me, babe. You've got me. Listen, I know you want to be pregnant, but when the rubber meets the road, you've got me. Baby, I'm the man of the hour. I'm the tower of power. I'm too sweet to be sour. I'll make you say, ho, like Jerry Clower. It just doesn't get any better than me. Listen, you may think that this is a primitive way for a culture to assign value, but every culture has things by which they assign value. We don't have chronological snobbery. We don't think how, how dare they. Historians tell us, for example, our society is the first one in human history to have pervasive eating disorders among young women. The reasons are complex, but one thing is certain, and that is when little girls grow up learning that they're supposed to look a certain way and that if they don't, they're second class, that starts turbulence inside of them. And young men are told similar things. Your significance is in how athletic you are or what you're Your earning potential is, and let me ask you all this question, where have you felt judged? By society. Where are you inwardly thunderous this morning? Was it it your homeschooling? Was it your ripped blue jeans? Was it your tattoos? Because a lot of times, like with Hannah, it's not even something you signed up for. It's just happened to you, and you feel the weight of it, and you've been tempted to turn elsewhere to fill the void. And for Hannah, she turned to the affection of her husband, and maybe your lack of Good looks has driven you to try to succeed. And maybe your lack of success has driven you to always try to look good. And maybe you too have unhealthily tried to establish your worth on being popular or being dominant or being academic or being musical or being sporty. We had 4,500 people here two weekends ago. It was awesome. And you know what? It was awesome until yesterday, or the day before, it was Friday, when I sat down with the president of our denomination at lunch, and he told me of some young buck on the West Coast who had 6,000 in his Easter service. Man, shame on me if I have to find fault in somebody else in order to establish my own self-worth. Half of you are nodding your head and saying, I get that, Pastor. The rest of you are thinking, are you qualified (laughs) to be our pastor after acknowledging that? But see, I think all of us can relate to Hannah. Our culture is different, but it's not that different. 
many women still feel like if they're not married with kids, a key part of their identity is missing. It's not just that this is sad for them. This is crushing for them, debilitating for them. Hannah's hurt is something we all experience. Why? Because we're searching for an identity and security and meaning. And what I'm telling you is that comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison will run off with your joy. The enemy of God will use comparison as a tool to turn your happiness into dislike and jealousy, and if you're not careful, utter hatred. Somebody here needs to choose this morning to live with hurt no longer. Let's turn from Hannah's hurt to second her purpose. Verse 9 is the turning point in Hannah's story. If you're not watching closely, you'll miss it. So Hannah arose after they'd finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Hannah, we already have missed it. She arose. The word arose isn't some obscure detail that refers to a posture. The word arose in the Hebrew indicates premeditated, decisive action. In other words, a more clear reading of the scripture may have been, so Hannah resolved, or so Hannah made a choice. Hannah made a decision. What was that choice? Well, we read it last weekend. Hannah said, I will give my child to the Lord should God choose to bless me. See, today it's a mixed bag on what it takes to be a pastor. You can go to a high church Role and still get a fairly rigorous education if you want to be a man or woman of the cloth. You can go the relaxed church route with very little formal education and become a pastor. You can even Google today how to get a mail-in clergy license so that you can marry your nephew to his fiance, whose name is Huck. <laughs> but in this day... In this day, you can only become a priest in one of two ways. Either you were born into the tribe of Levi, or you had to take what was called a Nazarite vow, where you would effectively renounce membership to your own family and access any inheritance, or rather, sever your access to inheritance in order to live, to live at the temple. It was similar in some ways to being a nun in a monastery. So basically, Hannah is renouncing everything that she would have wanted for a son in the first place. The farming. Showing him off at baseball games. Him providing for her in her old age. She'd forsake all of that and she'd give him to the Lord if only the Lord would grant her the pleasure of birthing him. Verse 18 is significant. So the woman went her way and ate and her face, help me, was no longer sad. Church family, notice the order of what happens. This is wildly significant. It's not pray, then get pregnant, then have joy. The order is pray, then have joy, then get pregnant. See how this works? Hannah goes on in song to talk about in chapter 2 God's unfathomable wisdom and his strength and his beauty and his holiness. This is Hannah's praise. I won't read it this morning, but I would challenge all of you to read chapter 2 before you go to bed tonight. In other words, Hannah sings, there's no one like the Lord. He's my absolute treasure and joy. I'm no longer dependent on children to provide that for me. I can have them. I cannot have them. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Hannah 
effectively sings the same thing the three Hebrew boys prayed. God can save us. God will save us. But if he doesn't, nothing changes. We will not bow to you, O king. Because he is the Lord. He's still faithful. He still saves me. He's still on the throne. And I have the absolute approval of the only one whose opinion of me really matters. My identity, she says, my security, my happiness is in Jesus. I may not have children, but I have God. I have you, Lord. There is none holy like you, Lord. There's no one besides you, Lord. Note this was Hannah's salvation, learning to find in God what she'd previously sought in having children. And by the way, Hannah did go on to have a son. And his name was Samuel. And he became the greatest prophet in Israel's history. Now, Hannah's prayer in chapter 2, it's a beautiful prayer. Again, I encourage you to read it. I'm not going to read it, but in verse 5, she says this. I will read this. The barren has born seven. She didn't mean a literal seven. That was a Hebrew number for completion. What is she saying? God would ultimately end up doing, through her son Samuel, more than God would do through all of Penina's children or 10,000 other sons of Israel. Samuel had more eternal significance than a bucket full of other kids. And not only this, but verse 21 of chapter 2 tells us, don't you love how good the Lord is? And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. This is what I call Hannah's promise. So in closing today, church family, God is a good God who loves to bless his people. And when Hannah changed her source of identity from bearer of many children to daughter of the king, God then blessed her with multiple kids. The point is not that as long as your heart is right, please hear me, as long as your heart is right, you'll get whatever you desire in life. That's not the point. The point is that God is a good God who loves to bless his kids. And it's often that when we release what has a stranglehold on our identity, being in success or in beauty or in family, that God puts a different version, a better version of things into our lives and into our story. Pastor, what in the world does this have to do with David? I mean, I came here for the bare stuff. (laughs) There's a parallel between Hannah's story and Israel's story. Just like Hannah sought identity, happiness, and security in a son, Israel sought these things in a king. To Hannah, God said, Hannah, these things aren't found in sons. To Israel, God says, Israel, these things aren't found in kings. To both Hannah and Israel, God says, identity, security, happiness are found in who? Are found in me. And then there is also a parallel between Hannah's story and your story. How is that, Pastor? Because Hannah looked to a son for her own identity, security, and happiness. Israel looked to a king for the same. The question I have for you is, to whom or to what are you looking for that which you will only find in God? What one thing must you have for life to be good? What do you care the most about obtaining or securing for yourself? What one thing could you not imagine life without? What are you currently yearning for that feels like life couldn't possibly be complete without it? 
About whom are you roaring with dissatisfaction right now in your stomach? To whom do you have jealousy right now? In what ways are you trying to, to, trying to accomplish enough or do enough or be enough? Because years later, the Bible would tell the story of another woman who faced an impossible birth. And her name was Mary. And her pregnancy wasn't just improbable like Hannah's. It was actually impossible. It was impossible. Mary didn't have a husband. Mary was chaste. Mary was pure. Interestingly for Mary, the roles were reversed. With Hannah, not having a baby meant the loss of everything. With Mary, having a baby meant the loss of everything. For a woman to be pregnant out of wedlock in Mary's day, this meant the loss of her reputation. It meant financial hardship. It meant being a societal outcast. But like Hannah, Mary grasped the gospel. And Mary surrendered to God's plan. Hannah gave birth to Samuel. Mary gave birth to Jesus. And might I gently remind you this morning that while works righteousness leaves you bitter insecure, disappointed. The gospel involves accepting what Jesus Christ is offering you as a gift. Jesus grew up and died so that you might have life. And your identity is found in being his child, his servant, and one day hearing him say what? Well done, good and faithful one. Jesus is the king Israel is looking for. Jesus is the king Hannah is looking for. And Jesus is the king that you and I are looking for. Would you bow your head this morning? Hannah's shame would be taken away so that she could be restored to God. Church family, our real, real need our real shame, our real brokenness, it's not that we can't have kids. It's not that we aren't pretty. It's not that we are still single. It's not that we aren't athletic. It's not that we aren't successful. Shame comes from our separation with God. He's the one your soul aches for. You don't need more money. You don't need more kids. You don't need more success or significance. You need to be reunited with your creator. Is there anybody here that would say that's me today, pastor? And just lift your hand so I can see. I just want to pray with you. I need to be reignited, praise the Lord, with my creator today. Awesome. Would anybody say that? I want to become a Christian today for the very first time. I see your hand, sir. Awesome. With those of you who have raised your hand this morning and those of you who have already been redeemed children of the King, pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I have sinned and fallen short of your glory. Just like David will fumble the ball, I have fumbled the ball. And I need help outside of myself. Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you change me? I look to you for my sonship. I look to you as your daughter. Declare me to be yours. You're my father. You're a good father. I accept you. I love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?
I'm going to pray a blessing over you today. May the words of your mouths and the meditation of your hearts be acceptable in his sight, your rock and your redeemer. God bless you. We'll see you soon.